Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the patient level prediction tutorial. Uh, it's going to be a full day about prediction, so that's really great. And I'm going to introduce you uh, to our uh, other faculty. Uh, so we have Joel in the back, um, with the blue shirt, and Jenna from uh, Janssen uh, Research and Development. And as you all may know, Jenna has been developing uh, most of the code in the, in the package. My name is Peter Rijnbeek. I'm from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, and I lead the patient level prediction group together with, uh, with Jenna. Um, the agenda of today, uh, you got it uh, on the paper as well. Um, I'm going to start with uh, talking about um, what actually is uh, patient level prediction. What do we mean with that? And also, what it's not. Then we'll have uh, an introduction from Jenna, a little bit more theory, a little bit more theoretical background. And then Joel will take over and we will talk about how to report prediction models in literature and what, what requirements do we have to um, apply there. The other uh, thing then is Jenna talking about implementation, how to really run these models uh, in the, with the patient level prediction package. And in the afternoon, it's, it's a lot of exercises done, uh, done by yourself. I always start my uh, presentations for Odyssey with showing this slide uh, because I think it's, it's very important that we keep in our mind what our uh, Odyssey uh, objective is and what our mission is. So the ultimate goal is really to improve health and we want to empower, empower a community, actually you guys in the room, to work together uh, to create uh, evidence and promote better health. Um, what I really like about this is that it's about creating a community and that we really want to work together to do something. That's also why all the code that we de we've developed is open source uh, and you could actually add your own algorithms in our package. Um, we used to think, we like to think about patients having a journey through life and uh, they experience different types of diseases, treatments, um, they get drugs. Um, and what we normally want to do for these patients is that at some moment, some point zero in time, uh, we want to um, use data before the moment in time to say something about, uh, about the future. But what, of course, we need to realize is that each patient has its own uh, journey. And it's actually, it's an incomplete um, journey. We don't have all the data of the patients and we need to keep that in, into account when we do our, our work. Each patient has its own um, trajectory, its own uh, journey. But we can ask different questions when we look at that uh, the data. So for example, we could ask the question, which treatment did patients choose after their diagnosis? Or which patients choose which treatments? Or how many uh, patients experience the outcome after the treatment? So this is actually more about counting how often something happens uh, in, in, in their life. It's data characterization, as we call it. What we also can uh, look at is questions like this. So what is the probability that I develop this disease? So that's more personalized, uh, that's a personalized prediction using all my prior medical information to say something about the future. Or for example, what's the probability that I will experience the outcome? So this is about inference. We want to infer something that happens uh, after a certain moment in time um, for the patient. We could go a step further and look at causal inference um, where we ask questions like, for example, does the treatment cause the outcome? Or does one treatment cause the outcome more often than, than an alternative? I will be talking in the first part of my presentation uh, mainly about the differences between inferring and causal inference. Um, and um, as you can see on this slide, um, clinical characterization is about observation, looking at the data, counting. Um, patient level prediction is about inference, and population level effect estimation um, is about causal inference. So if you want to do causal inference, you're actually in the wrong tutorial. Don't, don't <laughs> I hope you're not going, but that's, that's really important to, to realize, that we talk about inference here, not about uh, causality. Um, in, in Odyssey, um, we of course do a lot of methodological rese research and we develop new methods. We evaluate the performance of those methods. 
Um, but what's also very important is that we establish best practices based on experiments that we do on the data. So it's a data-driven approach where we want to learn from the data and, and get a, um, a proposal for a best practice for that specific method. We also do, of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, open source development. Um, so all the, all the source code is in the GitHub. Uh, you can look at it, you can add it, you can modify it, you can fork it, whatever you want. Um, so we implement methods for large-scale uh, uh, analytics. That's also what we do in the patient level prediction group. And we also like to build visualizations of the results. And we made a start with that as well uh, in our work group. The ultimate goal, of course, is as in all this work, getting clinical evidence and build something that's useful for the patient. And we want to do that uh, using the data network of Odyssey. So also the patient data prediction uh, uh, tool, the library, has been built in such a way that we can evaluate our models across the data network um, to look at external val uh, validity of the models. What's also important is that we want to have a fully transparent pipeline. So starting from the data extraction all the way to building the models, to sharing the models, to sharing the results, everything should be transparent and reproducible. And we, um, we get there by using these R packages, um, as you will see later. My first um, real presentation is about what is patient level prediction. Um, and it's, it's divided in three parts. So the first part is really the core questions, the differences being co between causal inference and inference. Um, then understand how we model, how we create models, patient level prediction models, what's the process that we have implemented, what are the best practices. Um, and then I'll show you uh, an example, a proof of concept study, where we apply these methods um, on, on, the real, on the real problem. Okay, so clinicians are confronted with prediction questions almost on a daily basis. For example, a patient with atrial fibrillation that uh, visits his doctor may have um, a question about his chance of, of getting a stroke. So for the physician, that's a very difficult question to answer. And most of these prediction questions, he actually cannot answer. So it, he, he would better say that he, he denied the ability to do that. But that's, of course, not a very good answer for the patient. Uh, so what the doctor could also do is quote an overall average to all the patients. Uh, so all the patients about that age, uh, their, um, their probability of getting disease is, is, is such and such. That is, of course, not really tuned to that specific patient, and it's, it's not the, the best, uh, best answer. The other thing the doctor could do is uh, think about patients in his practice that look like that patient and try to extrapolate that knowledge to the patient in front of him. But that's a very difficult task and also not optimal because you cannot remember all the covariates in the, in the data to make that um, um, extrapolation. So what would be better is if we could support the clinician uh, with these predictions and build advanced clinical prediction models using our data and, and all the tool set that we have um, to, to make that prediction based on, on, on a lot of data. So what's the problem that we want to tackle here in this, in this course? It's, it's shown on this, uh, on this figure. We have some moment uh, T0, for example, when a, when a patient is diagnosed with a certain disease, and we want to um, predict whether something else happens in the future, for example, in the next year, and we want to use all the information in the electronic health record before that moment of time. Um, what you will see is that we can define all of the prediction problems that we work on by, looking at in, in, by thinking about three very simple things. We define a target cohort. So the target cohort is the group of people for which you want to make the prediction, and we call that T. But we also want to predict something in the future, and that we call O, the outcome. So we have a T and an O. Well, we also need to define what is then the time at risk that we want to uh, use. What is that one year, two year, three years? So the T and the O that will come back many times during today. And at the end of the day, you, you, you will definitely know what we mean with that. And Jenna will come back to it many, many times as well. We try to define all our prediction problems by specifying what's the T, what's the O, and what's the time at risk. 
And of course, if you want to do the modeling itself, you have to define which models I'm going to use, which parameters, and which covariates. So that's also something that you have to specify um, uh, as well if you want to do a prediction. Yes? Could you a little bit more differentiate the target cohort from output cohort? Yes. Or yes. am I jumping the gun here? That would be a slide after this one, actually. Okay. So it's a very, very good question. I had the same question. <laughs> yeah. This is the slide. Yeah. So, so just a couple of examples on how we can use the TNO for different questions. So an example could be, and that's actually the example that I gave in the beginning of the patient visiting his doctor. Uh, I have a newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So that's the T. And I want to know uh, wh whether I will get an ischemic stroke, the O, the outcome cohort, in the next three years. So here the T is the AFib patient, or the, the date that he gets the uh, diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. And the outcome is the ischemic stroke. So th that's the T and the O in this, in this example. And the time at risk is three years. Yes? Okay, uh, so I don't get that. So this is for population that I understand, that, right? You have a cohort that right. share one certain set of criteria that makes a member of the cohort. Right. Here I'm alone. So yes, I have an AFib, and I have my ward removed, and my left eye is blind, and all these other things. Why are those not T's, and why is the atrial fibrillation a T? So it, what, what we do here is we define the question that we want to answer, right? So my question is simply, inpatient with AFib, uh, will they get stroke? I'm not saying which coverage you will use for doing that prediction. That's the next step. Well, if any patient, but what's the moment in time that you want to make the prediction in that case? So now? And if I, since yesterday, have atrial fibrillation, then obviously my, my, the model will tell me that my risk goes up significantly. But mm -hmm. why, why, do you, why do you limit this to patients with atrial fibrillation? If any of the uh, features that, that go in, mm -hmm. they are all equal, right? You know, I'm old and I'm pretty and I'm this and I'm that. And well, those are different questions. So other questions could be, at the current visit of my GP, what will be the chance of having a stroke? But then you have to make a model using the, the start of the visit actually as, as the T. Uh, that, that's also a possibility. The question is, why is AFib any different than any of the covariates that I also run around with? What's the difference between the AFib covariate uh, that I now have mm -hmm. versus any of the other things that characterize me? Can you know we that? Exactly. That's your right, right, exactly. So it, it's, you want to make a prediction in a certain group of people. That's actually the only thing that we say here. And how you define that, and if you want to make that broader, you can try to do that. But I think most of the questions actually are fitting in this, in this paradigm here, where you really have a cohort of interest of a group of people in which you want to make the prediction. And so then the is because you want causes? Is, is what? No, it's nothing. We'll get to that later on. It has nothing to do with causality. But there's a strong association between agent and stroke. Yeah. Could be. This, this I, I think. I think the issue is slightly broader. The question was, can you make a a parameter, a, a model input yeah. to the model, yeah. or do you want to make it as part of the cohort definition? And the answer that I would think of, the reason why you would want to think of some, this as cohort definition sometimes, is because. You want transferability, and the model class that we're looking at does not allow transferability in many other patients. It's an issue about the model class as opposed to a general. If you had a perfect ability to learn all the models under the sun, what you're saying is true, but we don't. So how do I know so what is a good class where there's a good uh, portability? So you want to test that. You want to <coughs> test that across different institutions. You want to test that across different types of you know, experiments. Okay, but why would you? Okay, this last one I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Just kicking now and then. then. <laughs> uh, but there must be something okay, that makes you believe that atrial fibrillation is a good cohort where things should be nicely transferable. There must should be something that why we put it on the on the on the board. Probably medical intuition at the start, as I guess. 
But okay. then you have to verify every intuition with, with data. Okay. It's an answer. You will, you will see. We will get to the causality question later. Yeah. So if we're ready to go on to another issue, I have a question about the treatment response line. Um, and the example seems to me very similar to the treatment adherence example. And I'm wondering, where does the question fit in amongst patients who are new users of drug X mm -hmm. with a certain disease? How many do not experience this expected complication <coughs> right. that that treatment is supposed to prevent? I think that this is not a complete list of all the things that we can do. So we can definitely also do that and take, take the cohort as the start of the drug and then predict an outcome. The, the point I want to make here is just that there are different types of questions that fit that TNO definition. Um, and that's nothing more than that, actually. Um, OK, so I want to talk now about the differences between explanatory modeling and prediction. And what often happens is that people uh, make causal claims when they do a prediction model. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's important to understand the differences between these two things. Um, what's actually pretty interesting is that the word model um, means something different from, for different people. It depends on your background. It depends, where, depends on where you come from, well, um, what model means for you. So for example, in people with a statistical background, they use model uh, mainly to describe data. They think about distributions. Um, the, mo the model is the distribution of the data, it describes the data. An epidemiologist is really trained to think about causality, uh, so how, f how things are related in a causal uh, way. So for them, a model is really about, a, it's a causal model by definition because they are only trained to think about that. For a data scientist uh, like me, a model is something else. So for me, a model is something about prediction, about using machine learning to make uh, a prediction about the future. It, it's very important to understand what we actually do when we build a prediction model compared to when we do population level effect estimation where we do causal inference. And there are some two very nice papers from uh, Shmuley uh, that were actually in the, as optional in your, in your homework. Um, they give a very nice overview on the differences between uh, explanation and prediction. And I'm going to highlight a couple of the things here because it's important for you to understand for the rest of, of the course. Let's start with a, a couple of uh, definitions here. So when we talk about an explanatory model, we, really, uh, we mean a theory-based statistical model for testing causal in, uh, hypotheses. And the power of such a model is actually how, how st how, what the strength is of the relation of the causal relation in the statistical model. If we talk about predictive modeling, we want to predict new observations, unseen uh, people in the future. The predictive power there is really the accuracy, the ac the, how accurately we can predict those new observations. So those are, those are two different things. And of course, if you would, do, if you would make a... Uh, um, a model, like if you would make an explanatory model, you can assess its uh, predictive power. But the other way, you cannot. So if you build a predictive model, the empirical, uh, the, the, the explanatory power cannot be assessed. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that uh, later on. It's therefore uh, not true that the best explanatory model is by definition the best prediction model. And uh, in a, a couple of slides ahead, I will show you uh, for a logistic regression uh, what it actually is. So for prediction, you really don't need to understand the underlying causes. You really, your only goal is to predict something in, in the future. So if we look at the process of uh, building models, um, they have different, um, they have quite a lot of differences. So the goal of explanatory modeling is to uh, get causal, uh, to test hy causal hypothesis, and to do prediction is to predict new observations in the future. The variables of interest in these two uh, examples are also uh, different. So the variable, uh, variables of interest when doing an explanatory model are really based on theory, and you include those elements in the model that you think are causal and you want to test. While in prediction, you just want to use all the available data that you have in your data set 
and use that as best as you can to make the prediction in the future. Um, it also means that the optimization functions are, are different. Um, you don't want to have, you want to minimize the bias in the model when you do explanatory modeling. But for prediction modeling, you actually do not want to do that. Because you want to be able to build a model that transports well to unseen data. So you want to have a good balance between the bias and the variance of the model. Most of the time, uh, you actually want a model that's not unbiased on your training set but you want to have a model that uh, transports well to unseen data, and therefore you have to make some uh, concessions in your bias. Jenna will uh, show that also a little bit later on when we look at um, um, hyperparameter training in the models. Um, the also, the constraints are different. Um, for explanatory modeling, of course, you want those parameters in the model to be explanatory. You want to understand them. Well, in prediction, that's not, it's not important. You just want to know uh, how well your model performs using all the data that you have. That also means that the evaluation of these models is, is different. Um, in prediction, uh, we look at unseen data. We have a holdout set and try to predict for that set. And that actually is our performance of our model, our unseen, uh, our out of sample prediction. This means that, yes. So, um, uh, I'm, my training is epidemiology and uh, yeah. engineering. So that's not completely sort of up to date. The slides just parsing it. I just have to bring it up and describe. Sure. There's techniques uh, like uh, targeted maximum likelihood estimation and collaborative targeted ma maximum likelihood estimation, where you're actually doing a hybrid. You're using a, a prediction model, all the features mm -hmm. you can, to predict the exposure, your, your A variable or whatever. And then you actually induce this uh, uh, pre treatment balance for the exposure drug of interest, and then you go after the what is the causal effect using right. like doubly robust method. So it's I think that's sort of true maybe ten years ago, but there's mm -hmm. in, there's increasing gains where you're blurring this and it's like a causal ML space. So right. I, I think that's a good framing. Like here's these two separate right. worlds, but they've been agreed. Agreed. So agreed. So there are indeed also ways to use predictive modeling causal inference. So there is a blur there. I agree. Yeah. I didn't want to go into that detail here, but I'm, uh, I agree, yeah. Okay, uh, so one of the things that I want to discuss now briefly is the term risk factor. So uh, in discussing with uh, epidemiologists, we often are confronted that people ask us, what's the risk factor? What, what are the risk factors in our model? And we think we should uh, try to avoid the term risk factor in, in most of the predictive modeling that we do, um, because that assumes some sort of causality is some sort of causal uh, relationship the world the word so what we see uh, as a better term is actually to use predictors in this uh, for this for these covariates because the only thing that we assess here is the association between each of the individual elements with the outcome and um, if your if your goal is to do uh, causal factors to find risk factors you really have to go to um, population level effect estimation or use those more advanced models that you uh, alluded to where you combine both of the methods. Um, so what we through the, through the course will do, we try to avoid the, the word risk factors here and talk, talk mainly about uh, predictors. Um, as, a, as an example, um, a simple example here, uh, like a logistic regression model. So in a logistic regression model we, we weight the parameters, the, the individual predictors with the betas. Um, and what each of these betas mean is actually the additive value of that specific covariate uh, in the total performance of the full model. That means that any change in the model, any beta that, uh, or any parameters that you put in, to take out or put in, uh, could affect the other betas. So you should be careful in imp interpreting these betas as being um, the causal weights or anything like that. For example, if the beta is zero, so if the variable does not enter uh, the model, uh, you actually cannot say by definition that there is no association of, this, of that parameter with the outcome. Because there may be other parameters that were in the model that are indeed selected by the, by the methods that we use, but this parameter could be highly correlated with that one and therefore it's not in the model. So you cannot say that parameters that not end up in the model do not have an association with the outcome. 
if it ends up in the model, so if the beta is not zero, you can indeed say there is an association. You can still not say that there's a causal uh, relationship uh, with any of these betas. On the other hand, if it's positive or negative, that's maybe valuable. But on the other end, it's only positive under the assumption of all the other parameters in the model. Uh, so, and there are, I've seen examples where by getting a parameter out and in, the be other betas could switch sign even. So interpreting those betas as being additive effects or not is, is, is a little bit dangerous. And you should be careful with uh, making these uh, interpretations of these models. Then you may wonder, so why is predictive model modeling then still valuable if we cannot do that causal uh, step? Um, I, I think I, I see a, a lot of potential for predictive modeling uh, because most of the time you actually don't want to know why something happened, uh, but you just want to know what's going, going to happen to me, what with my data will happen to me in the future, and, and why that is is not always the most important thing. Secondly, I think it's interesting to under, that we understand better how well we can predict outcomes um, based on the data that we have. And because that could trigger us to either get more data or, or expand our covariates. Um, and that will be helpful in the end also for the patient because we can build better prediction models. And of course, all the uh, questions here are really questions that patients have. Uh, and there's none of, they don't ask why. They just want to understand what will happen to them and, and maybe uh, understand um, if, if they need to do something else or change. Um, we had some questions in between. Are there any questions at this point that you'd like to raise? Otherwise, I suggest we continue. No? Okay. Um, I'll give now a little bit more background on the prediction in general. And as you see uh, in this graph, there's a lot of interest in predictive modeling over the years. Um, and that's mainly because, of course, we got more and more data. Well, we also got a more computer power at our hand to do this type of work. And, it's, and a lot of data scientists are, are looking into predictive modeling on, on uh, health data. On the right, you see a, a Wordle that I, I made by uh, doing a search in, in PubMed on predictive uh, prediction, prediction models, and then annotating all the diseases in the, in the titles. And what you see is actually the frequency of the diseases that were in the title of all those papers. Uh, all those papers in, uh, in PubMed. And you see that heart failure is a very often studied uh, problem or lung cancer and cardiovascular disease as well. Um, there's actually a, um, well, an overview of all the different prediction models in, in, in some diseases. And you see that there are actually 800 models um, developed for cardiovascular disease. And so also for, for stroke, uh, the example that I gave in the beginning with the atrial fibrillation patient, there are 83 different models, uh, but you need to understand that these models have not all been developed in that specific cohort at risk that I was looking at, the atrial fibrillation uh, case. Um, so this is an, an, an example of a, a, a model for um, atrial fibrillation, which is the CHATS2 score, uh, which is built in, um, a while ago, and, and that will be a returning um, prediction problem during the course, and all of us actually will talk about this, uh, this specific problem. Here it's just a, uh, a regression model. It's a weighting of uh, a limited set of, of parameters. So if you look into this prediction problem and our framework that we defined, here the, the T, the target cohort, was patient newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. The outcome was stroke. The time at risk was 1,000 days, and they used a logistic re uh, regression. Uh, with five pre-selected covariates. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's a nice paper, and I think it's also was also in your handout is, or in your homework as optional reading, is the paper from Goldstein where they looked at literature and looked at all the different types of uh, prediction models that are out there, and they tried to assess the quality of them, and uh, I think they're what were some nice insights from this paper. What we often see is that the, these models are not validated well enough. There's not internal validation. They just build a model and present the model. They don't test it internally. Um, I will show a little bit later how you can do this by, by defining a train and a test set. 
they also use often a small set of features and, and then the immediate question is what would happen if we would add more and more data, more of covariates, would these models be better if we add, uh, add more information? Um, they do not disseminate the models well enough. Most of them actually do not even tell you what the final model is. So you have a paper, it says a high, it says a high AUC, looks nice, but then, then what? I cannot take the model, I cannot, put it on my, I cannot run it on my own data set. Uh, which I think is actually useless. And, and we really want to change that uh, by the pipeline that we build and the R packages that we, that we have created. They don't assess, most of these papers don't assess transportability of the model. So if I build a model on my own data set, how well does the model perform on your data set? And how well does it perform within a data network? And of course, within, within Odyssey, we have big opportunities to, to look at this. And this should really be our core to understand better how these models transport all over, transport all over the world. Um, the impact on clinical decision making is actually a pretty hard one. So how do we assess, assess what that model that will be used in practice uh, really does for the patient? And that's a quite a hard question. There are some ideas about that, but it's not been done often uh, in literature. This means, what's question, yeah. Important comment is that often I've never seen subgroup analysis, for example, by race. So yeah. I don't know how well it's performing on Indian patients, for instance. So how can I really trust this to apply to me? Right. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. So we sh we should make pipelines that could assess and, and build models on all those different types of cohorts, and understand how well they transport to everybody else. Um, so that's actually what we try to do in our. Uh, our work group, that's our main goal. Create these systematic processes to learn, but also evaluate these models at a large scale um, using all the data in our Odyssey data network. So that starts with evidence generation, evidence evaluation, and then evidence dissemination as well, where we really want to share these models with the broad community and everybody should be able to download them and run them against our nice CDM that we've been working on for so many years. Um, so the second part of my presentation is how to build and validate a, a prediction model. And we've um, created like a, uh, a pipeline starting with uh, a problem definition. Uh, so we, we want to pre-specify in a study protocol what we actually want to uh, predict, what is our problem. And we want to share that with everybody. Uh, and we, as you know, we do that uh, on, the, on the GitHub site in Odyssey where you have all the different studies. Um, where you can just download the protocol. <coughs> then we have the data extraction step. So once we defined that we want to look at patients with atrial fibrillation and, and predict stroke, we need to have tools to extract all the data from our uh, CDM. Um, and Martin Schumi has been working very hard on, on creating the feature extraction package that we will use to extract all those covariates once we have defined the cohorts. Um, so what we do, and as, as you see here in this, um, in this figure, we define the two cohorts, the T and the O, uh, as any other cohort that we would create in Atlas. Um, and our package will automatically look at those patients that are in T, whether they develop the, the outcome. Uh, so we look at the overlap of the two. The nice thing about that is that we can reuse these cohorts for different types of questions, and we can look at different overlaps between the target cohort and the outcome cohort. Uh, quite easily. Um, yeah, data extraction is done with a feature extraction package. Um, you can specify the, the candidate predictors there, um, and we will get to that also with uh, the demonstration from, uh, from Jenna. We then have to define how we're going to train and test the model, and we implemented a couple of options here. So, for example, a person split where we assign randomly a patient to the trainer the test set, but also time splits can be, uh, is implemented. So you, predict, you build your model on a period in time and then predict uh, in another period of time, so patients in that um, later time period. So what we've done now, we have specified what our prediction problem is. Um, we have extracted the data. We defined how we want to train and test by using, for example, person split. But now we have to decide which model are we now going to train uh, and how are we going to evaluate uh, the model. So, yes? So what is, 
when the climate risk starts, no features can be added. So if I have an atrial fibrillation, and all sorts mean? of other bad <coughs> risk factors, oh, that's not the right word, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, get added, you can't build a baseline in. What do you mean with get added? Well, I not only have atrial fibrillation, now I also had a little myocardial infarction, and I had a little, what else, what are the other goodies? A kidney problem, you know. Well, but you mean after T0? After T0. Yeah, no. So we use, we, we have a moment in time from that we want to predict. Okay. Yeah, no. So just to clarify, it's because T0 is now. Uh, and well, we, can't, we don't know the future other than predicting. Exactly. So if, if it's now T1, we can rerun the model, but now it's T0. Right. So then the, the, the thousand days there, that's just the duration in which the outcome can happen. Exactly. Okay. You got it. Okay. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why are you moving so your own country? Not necessarily a competition, but there's two classes of prediction problems. One of which has a, you know, we're thinking of T0 as the, the time in which the analysis is occurring for a particular person. Right. Um, there's a gap in time, but those, those are prognostic. And diagnostic models don't have that same relation. T0 might be. Right, so you're using past data to predict something that's actually happening now, what, what the most likely diagnosis is for the person. So I don't know if, I mean, just in general, uh, sure. that's, that's, a, that's a second class of yeah. problems for more, not necessarily for today or for this sure. course, but it's just worth it. Yeah, we well, use it for phenotyping. Great data. Actually, but we actually are using this framework even exactly for that. It's just that your target risk is D0. Right, exactly. So, right. so it, it, everything yeah. fits. It's just set that number right. to zero. Right. right. And yeah. another point, Christian's uh, comment. Notice this is about training. This slide is talking about training. When you're at the point of using it for a new patient, you can use all the data that you have right up to right now. So things would look different. You can basically keep using new information up to right now on a rolling basis. Um, so the model selection, let's let get back to that. Uh, so we have to decide which model we're going to use. And we've implemented a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms in the package, and that, that list is, is growing. Um, we do think that there is not a, a, a algorithm that works best for all problems. So we made the package in such a way that we can run different models and compare the models when we do training. That's actually called the no free lunch theorem, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, so we, we really see model selection as an empirical question. Uh, so using the data, we want to learn which is the best model for our specific problem. Yeah. Well, that question is exactly what we want to answer with the pipeline that we have. Because that, that question is not, is not for that specific uh, oh, you didn't. Uh, so, um, so, so, so your question was: Is there a big variability between uh, the models? And 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 that is something that we we don't know. We've done a proof of concept study where we, within one prediction problem, compared a couple of algorithms and tried to see whether there were were trends in different outcomes. And I will show you later that's not really the case. Um, so there is no clear answer to that. Um, there are, of course, algorithms that are just too simple to work well. So, but the, the most uh, yeah, sophisticated models that are out there, most of the time, work quite comparable regarding performance. But there can be a situation where one is better than the other, and we therefore need to test them. And compare them. Yes. Um, so, how much is? And I don't know the space, but how much literature is there around the selection of the algorithm as far as it affects the portability of the model? Is that is that a big driver of the fit of the data? I also, so uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't think there's, well, there is literature about that. And of course, we know that some models, they are m much more complex and will probably transport um, 
less than simpler problems. So in general, we want to, we want to use the most simple, uh, simple model that's out there. But it doesn't, it's, it, it, the answer to the question is not really known. And that's something we could actually, could be one of the questions that we have in our work group to assess exactly these type of questions. And you can only do that by having that pipeline, having the common data model, which is fantastic, because we can run standard code on that, and run that code many times and use all the computer power that we have to answer these type of questions. That's just a pointer to, in the literature, this question is called covariate shift. And there's a large literature on covariate shift within the machine learning community. So we can Google for it and you find it lots of it. Um, so we were, we were thinking, okay, done, but how do you now start with this process? So we need to start with one algorithm and, and then maybe go to another one. Um, we've been thinking about that. and we are, We're not really sure about the right answer yet because we want to do that on, uh, on a large, uh, large set of problems. Um, but you can start with, a, with one algorithm. We, we most of the time start with a lasso logistic regression because we have good experience with that and we assess the performance and, and, and try to understand if that's good enough for the question that we have at hand. If that's true, then we may actually decide to stop and say, this performance is good enough, I'm going to use this model, I'm going to report the results, I don't forget to share my model, I do everything as we, we think is our best, uh, best uh, practice. You could then, of course, try to change parameters. You could learn the parameters by using hyperparameter training as well. And Jenna will talk to that. That's actually a process to learn the best settings for your model. Um, if that doesn't work, you can decide to go to the next model. Um, and we just made a list of algorithms here that um, for the, ex the experiments that we've done work pretty well. Um, so we do logistic regression, random forest, gradient boosting, neural networks, etc. You can expand that list as much as, as you want. The other option, if that still doesn't give you a good answer, is, is try to get other covariates in the model uh, and expand maybe, maybe your, your search page by, by taking other type of covariates. But also, if that doesn't work, um, then actually you may not have the right data. So you may want to train it on another database. If that then still doesn't help, um, then you ac actually have one option, and that is select another prediction problem. Uh, but also in that case, I would say we should not forget to report the fact that we cannot uh, model, cannot get good predictions on the data that we have. Uh, remember the, the, the point two that I made earlier, what's the use of prediction model? This is exactly uh, point two. Because if we don't share that information, then somebody else is going to spend thousands of dollars of computer power to run that same algorithm on the databases. And I, I think that we should avoid that. We should be transparent and share all that results um, with the community. Question. Yeah. So at, at this point, do you uh, conclude that this question is not a good candidate for prediction modeling? Because yeah, what so else can you do if you don't have the appropriate data right. and methods? Right. You could always argue maybe we can invent another method that works better, uh, but that's pretty challenging. I think uh, currently machine learning is at a, at a level that we are not talking about any big changes. Um, so I don't, if, if the performance is very low, the chance that you will invent another model, even if it's a deep model or, or whatever, is not that, that big. Uh, yeah. Well, I think people struggle with how to find their covariates. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, sure. No, and, and I think actually that to gain uh, predictive power, we should not maybe think too much about new algorithms, or we should think about better feature engineering. Uh, we should invent more time in that, looking at, personally, I'm very interested in trends over time and see whether the temporal information in the record is actually predictive. Um, and I, I think it is, and we've done some examples, some of the posters, one of the posters actually that I presented was showing that, uh, where we, c we, we need to put that into the models. The temporality, I think. Uh, you were first. Within this, this loop of uh, selecting models, how are you thinking about training and validation and so forth so that as you're going through a bunch of model, model approaches, you're not you know, curating the best one versus 
right. comparable. Sure. The setting side of a sample. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Because you need to be careful that you're not putting the selection of the model in the evaluation of the full data set. Uh, so you could th actually think of a three, three parts of the data set and training validation and the test set if you want to, if you really want to get that out of the, uh, the training. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah, so, so your question is what, what's the effect of, of, the, of how do you select the time at risk and what would be the effect of that on, on the performance of, of the model. Um, there has been some research done on that and, and, and you can actually see that you can predict better things that occur closer to the index day, which what you would, would expect. Um, most of the time, the time window is defined by the, quest, by the question that you uh, want to solve. Uh, but there are ways, of course, especially with our prediction package, you could just make a loop over the time of risk and see what the effect is of, of changing the time of risk um, on your model performance. And I think it, your question is actually a paper. And, and that, that's what I really like about the, these discussions. And that's also what the work that uh, Jen and I have been doing triggers is that there you will get a lot of research questions. Um, and, oh, and that's a very good example. It would be a very nice paper to see what the effect is of changing the time at risk for different algorithms um, and do that over, let's say, 100 cohorts and, and 100 outcomes. Um, those are very interesting papers. And those have not been done much because people are not using the standardization of the CDM. And it's hard to define all those uh, outcomes and do that training in a standardized way. And we, we really, as a community, so you guys, you can write that paper uh, if, you, if you learn how to use the package and, and do this. So, okay. Sorry, so for changing the database, I, that this may have been implicit in what you're saying, but it sounded like you were talking about changing to a new database. But another thing that's free to vary or worth pointing out is that our databases aren't static and a lot of people are trying to include different kinds of data. So if sure. whole, like adding NLP or adding all or adding imaging or adding some other source is yeah. another way to understand whether the same kind of method operating on a richer and, and you know, Absolutely. better yeah. set of data would, or an augmented set of data would increase performance. Absolutely. Yeah, so f for example, in our data set uh, in Rotterdam, we have a GP data set where we have a lot of unstructured data in clinical notes. And we know from our manual exercises that there is there's a lot of information in those notes that are not in the coded information. Uh, there are some diseases that are just not coded by the physician because he's not getting paid for that code. But he, did, he does write, uh, write this in, in, the, in the letter. Uh, so using that knowledge, uh, getting that out of the system is valuable. And we're actually working, for example, on this specific problem with the NLP group to get all the unstructured information into the loop. And there's actually an example of extending the change in the covariates there within the same database. We also have a question. Uh, yeah. Could you elaborate a little more the, the gifted model of the algorithm? Yeah. That, that's actually, yeah. So the, the answer actually is this. Um, we, we don't have a clear answer. Uh, to the order. The only thing that we can share now is based on the experiments that we have so far is that, uh, that Lasso is most of the time doing a very good job. Uh, and the other algorithms like the random forest and the gradient boosting machine are often very close. And some, in some examples, they are indeed better. Uh, in the proof of concept study that we've done with people with depression, we indeed, indeed see that on some of the outcomes, the GBM is a little bit better than the Lasso. Uh, but that's not really, well, that's nice to show, but you really want to understand why that is. Uh, and we need, to, we need to do more research to answer that question. It might be, for example, that there are interactions that are not included in the lasso. And by, by adding the interaction terms in the lasso, you can get to the same level. And that the GBM is, is just um, better because he does, that's included there. So there can be many, many reasons, and we don't know. But what I would do if I would run a model and I need to uh, do a prediction problem, I would just start with this order and see what happens. I probably will end up with doing them all anyway. Uh, uh, but yeah, 
it, it depends on how much time you have and how much computer power you have, whether you want to do that. Uh, can can take time to run. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what's your thoughts. Sorry. Uh, is the core of packages uh, in our just, just, you have to provide the algorithm that you cannot provide a list of algorithms and, and, and the package will be used? Yeah, so. Yeah, you now can run one at a time, but it's actually very simple to uh, to make one for loop around the code, and you can do that. Yes, uh, yeah. And we are actually at, at Erasmus. We've now added some code in our um, in our code set where we do ensembles of models. So you can you can run you can select whatever number of models and whatever number of input data sets, and run an ensemble of these uh, models, and then weight them in different ways uh, or stack them uh, on top of each other. It's also, that is again a research question, so how much can we gain by combining these models? Do, do we actually need to select one or should we actually do multiple, multiple types of models? So I was a little bit confused about how T0 gets to one. Yeah, so in, in the example of the atrial fibrillation uh, patient, T0 can be the day that he, uh, he was diagnosed atrial fibrillation. So th at that moment, you want to make a prediction. That's actually what, uh, what T0 is here. So that's for cohorts that are defined, like a binary trigger. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're either in or out of the cohort. That's with the Venn diagram that you saw earlier. Um, yes, you're in or out of the, of, of, the, of the cohort, and you do or not get the outcome. Yes. Okay, uh, then we get to uh, evaluation. So we've now had some I insights in how to build the model, but how do we now evaluate the model? Um, and what we look at, uh, as, as, as you may know, is we look at discrimination and calibration. And in discrimination, you want, you want to differentiate between those with and without the outcome. And you hope that you predict a higher probability for those with the event. Um, compared to those who do not experience the event. In calibration, we want, to, uh, we want to assess whether the estimated probabilities are close to the really observed frequency of the outcome. And I'll go a little bit more in detail in these two uh, factors, these two uh, measures for uh, model validation. Often, um, in the papers that you see out there, people talk only about discrimination and calibration is, is forgotten. Um, by putting that in our package as a standard output, we actually always create both, uh, both results. Um, so how to assess uh, discrimination? Um, so th this is a, a simple uh, example. As suppose we have a very, uh, very simple classifier where we say that the BMI above a certain level um, will give you the outcome. Um, both of the of the classes have their own distribution. You can see here with the blue and the, and the red curve. And the choice of x is actually determines where you put the threshold and, and how many people of the red and the blue distribution you will classify as uh, a case or a non-case. And so you can create this uh, two by two matrix where you see the observed and the predicted. Um, and for example, the true positives uh, are, uh, as you see here in this curve, all the people that are red uh, that are indeed after the threshold. Um, same the other way around for the true negatives. Uh, and the false negatives are actually the errors that you make uh, when you place that position um, somewhere. Um, so what you can then can draw is um, the false positive rate and the true positive rate in this, in this graph. You can plot them against each other and you will get a curve like this. I have a, a small uh, animation oh, sorry. that um, to demonstrate that. So what you see here, if you move, if you move the line, so if you change the threshold, you move over this curve. And this curve is called the receiver operator characteristic uh, curve. And so the, the dependent on the choice of your threshold, you will make more false positive or more uh, false negatives. However, if these two 
um, distributions are closer to each other, what you will see is that this curve will go down. And so it's harder to distinguish, to, to make a good separation between the two classes. And that's why the, the, the area under this curve uh, is often used as a, as a measure for how well you can separate the two classes with your classifier. So if they would completely overlap, as you see here, you cannot distinguish one from the other, and the uh, area under the curve is actually a half. So what we aim to do is get uh, an area under this receiver, oper uh, receiver operator characteristic curve uh, that is close to, uh, close to one. And this is only works for binary outcomes. Correct. Yeah, not for the yeah that's a good point. So we, we talk here about binary outcomes. So we don't talk about time to event uh, things here. And, and also not uh, about continuous outcomes like in regression. Um, okay, so this is area on the curve, binary outcomes, uh, discrimination. Uh, the calibration is how well your model is calibrated, which means that what's the agreement between the observed number of people that get the disease and the predicted number of people that get the disease. And we want to have a model uh, that has good uh, calibration across all the ranges of the prediction, not just on average. So as an example, a model is well calibrated if for every 100 individuals given a risk of P, uh, close to P, that P number of events are observed in the data. So for example, taking that uh, atrial fibrillation patient again, if we predict 12% risk that that atrial fibrillation patient will have a stroke within the next year, the observed observation, the, the observed proportion of people in the data set should be close to that 12 out of 100. And we can uh, visualize that by drawing, uh, drawing this curve, where you have the uh, predicted probability on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the observed uh, frequency, uh, observed, observed number of people with, with the outcome. So that means that uh, if our uh, calibration curve is more on the upper left side, you underestimate the performance, underestimate the probability uh, of the outcome. And if it's under the curve, it's overestimation. Um, Jenna will come back to that a little bit later on in the tutorial uh, with another visualization um, to explain this. Okay, so I yeah. ask again. Um, so wait, so let me get back. So every, every patient gets a different prediction. I have 12%, you have 24%. Okay. So now, if you want to, uh, to calibrate, then all people like me, off the of the people like me, 12% will get it, correct? But who are the people like me? Isn't that the 12%? So 12% means 12% chance. So 12 of me, um, no. It, uh, if there are 100 uh, people like me, 12 of them will get the stroke, right? That's the prediction. Right? If there are 100 people who also have a 12% predicted risk, 12% right. of those people will in fact have the outcome. I see. So your, your commonality is your predicted risk. Got it. Yes, that's the yeah. Could you repeat that uh, right now? <coughs> Peter, can you repeat that? Yeah, so 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 what what we do here is is we 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 sort uh, the population on the predictive value. Uh, and you see that on the on the top um, within that within a certain um, uh, time window uh, if a time window, within a certain window of probability, uh, you will find that exact number of people really in the population. Uh, so if we look at um, those people that are predicted to have uh, a pred prediction of 50%, we indeed find in that group of people, 50% of the people uh, that have that <coughs> in the real data set. What I'm trying to understand is <coughs> if there is an And, and then you also, in, in reality, really observe 12 out of 100. And therefore, you are actually on the, on the diagonal. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I still have trouble understanding it. Well, let's say I'm just trying to do X and do some good out of X. These right. concepts are a little confusing. Yeah. Assuming I had a perfect prediction, mm -hmm. which has perfect discrimination, does it mean I'll get perfect calibration? Um, I don't have to see examples of good discrimination and terrible calibration. Because yeah. how can I be super good at discrimination and get the 12% right? If, if I'm getting the, the 12% wrong, then how can I be good at discriminating yes or no? Can I to, uh, repeat the question? Yes. So his, his question is, uh, if you have perfect calibration, and would you then also have, of, of which you have perfect uh, discrimination, which you then also, by definition, also have perfect calibration? I mean, it's, it's all measuring the quality of how am I doing, right? Let's say how good I play soccer. And by one measure, I play perfectly. And then suddenly, by other measure, I'm a terrible soccer player. So I still don't understand uh, how can I be good at If it's all, both measuring the, the goodness in soccer, how can I, how can there are like two of the same? No, never mind, I'll, I'll yeah, get it in later. So, so the discrimination is, is you're okay, just gonna break down. Speak up, Joe. So, uh, so if you have like the discrimination is you Louder. <laughs> 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 so we're gonna make her up. Mike. Mike her up. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. Um, so the discrimination is just the ranking. So you, you have the right order of the people. So the model said that these people are high risk and they're the ones who get it. These are low risk, these are the people who aren't going to get it. But the calibration is, did your risk match the, the, the like, whether you're going to have your true risk? So if you had it perfect, their true risk would be in like one. But the model might have said 0.25 for the people who are going to get it and, zero, and 0.1 for the people who aren't going to get it. So the, the risk assigned to them wasn't perfect, but their ranking, their, their discrimination, their ordering was perfect. So you can have a perfect discrimination with a bad calibrated model. But I would argue if you've got perfect discrimination, calibration is irrelevant anyway, because you can pick everyone. So you know these people are going to get it, these people aren't going to get it. So if you have a, a good, perfect discrimination, then calibration doesn't matter. Um, so that, that's about what we call internal validation. So here we, we test on a test set within the same data set. What we really want to push for is doing external validation so that we validate the models on other, to other data sets. Um, and we, we've, we've done some experiments with that, uh, with our package. So we build models uh, for patients with pharmaceutically treated depression uh, on one data set and evaluated those on, uh, on another uh, data set. And I think this should actually be the standard way of building models, of looking at the external validation in a data network. Uh, dissemination is then the, the last uh, step. Um, so we really want to push for sharing the models, sharing uh, the results of the models in a very consistent way. And we are thinking about, for example, creating like a, a website that contains all the different models that we've developed. Uh, with all the outcomes, with all the performance measures uh, in there. Um, and of course, we want to follow uh, best practices for sharing results. And Joel is going to talk about tripod statement, which is a consensus document that, is, that prescribes how we should report our, our performances and how we should write, down, write our papers on these uh, problems. Um, we had questions. I'm going to skip that because of time. So the third part uh, is just showing you an example um, of a um, prediction problem that we've been working on uh, last year. And that's uh, the problem of predicting um, in patients with uh, pharmaceutically treated depression uh, a whole list of outcomes and 22 different outcomes. And we run that on uh, four different databases uh, in, in Johnson. We use all the uh, demographic conditions and drug use uh, information before um, the date that they got that uh, pharmaceutically treated depression event. Um, so there were some, there's a cohort definition to define the target cohort. Uh, they should at least have 30, uh, 365 days of history, 
have some follow-up time, and it should be the first event. So there should not be any occurrence of uh, pharmaceutically treated depression before time zero. What we've done is run that on uh, four databases, four big databases uh, with a lot of depression patients, as you can see here. Um, we extracted the data. We did a time split for uh, training and testing. Um, we also looked at the transportability of one of the outcomes, which was stroke, um, and run, in this case, these three algorithms, uh, gradient boosting machine, random forest, and regularized regression. And we looked at all these outcomes that you see on the right um, within that cohort T. So these are 22 different O's in uh, the T, pharmaceutically treated depression. Uh, so, for example, for stroke, which is the question that we had in the beginning of the patient visiting uh, the, uh, his GP, uh, we have quite a lot, large number of uh, patients with stroke in these uh, databases and, and in these cohorts. Um, so what we've been creating then was these kind of, of plots. And let me explain a little bit what you, uh, what you see here. So you have four different panels. And these panels are the different databases. So CCAE, MDCD, MDCR, and Optin uh, for big databases, main claims, claims databases. Within these panels, we have different algorithms, gradient boosting, random forest, and regularized regression. And we show for all those different outcomes that are here at different columns, we show the area under the uh, op operator characteristic curve, the AUC. That means that if it would be perfect, it would all be blue cells. Um, green is already pretty high, up to 80% for that specific algorithm within this database uh, for this outcome. So here you see, yes. Uh, um, just, just real quick, so I can put this on my own mind. So this may have nothing to do with the model itself. It may have to do with the discriminating power of the information you're using in the model. Sure. So. Yeah. Um, even though you're comparing different models, you may never get to blue because you just don't have all the information yeah. needed or they're, or they're You're right. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, when there's heavy class imbalance, yeah, you see to look for the gradient, but you may not have a gradient. Um, repeat, repeat. He's not finished with answer, asking. <laughs> so when you have class imbalance, so. For instance, a small fraction of cases, or, or you know, whatever it, the thing you're looking at, say stroke, um, or, or inversely a high fraction. If you just have a model that says, let's call everything stroke, your AUC can still be quite high. Have you, th uh, when you're comparing these different things, are you picking balanced sets of cases and controls so AUC is going to be sort of apples to apples across these different? categories or maybe use the MCC one that's weighted for right this is this is just the, uh, the standard uh, RC but there are indeed other ways you could also look at the precision recall curve uh, in this case mm -hmm. but we don't do any weighting here for the for the class imbalance no. but but yes we are, I'm aware of the problem and actually um, we are thinking about ways to do that uh, also the, the MCC measures nice it, yes it, it a single number you can produce. Yeah, good, good uh, suggestion. Michaelis cor correlation coefficient or something like that. You can look it up. AUC, ROC, MCC. You'll find a wiki page that shows a calculation. But basically, the the rarer class will get a lot more weighting um, for for having to get it correct than the less rare class. Right. Great. It's really important that nothing outside of this class, you all come away with a common vocabulary for how to talk about problems. So as you were trying to describe it, Christoph, you started talking about it as cases and controls. And that very explicitly is not this framework. We're talking about given a target a cohort D, who are the subset of people who have or belong to the outcome of in the time of this. It's just important to, to frame it that way, because when you start thinking of the world as cases and controls and waiting and stuff, you're really thinking about a very different problem than what we're talking about. Right, right. I'm just thinking a binary outcome, one, zero, but, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so one column here shows the performance of these different uh, models on these different data sets. 
So what's nice is because we have our framework and we have our whole pipeline is that we can run the same thing on all these different outcomes. And you get this kind of uh, plots where we now show um, the AUC in these different, uh, for those different outcomes. And it's interesting to look at this. And, and uh, for example, we see that in one of the databases we are not able to predict as well as in the other databases. And we, one question there is why is that? And we need to look into that. This is a, a data set with a much older people. That can actually be the reason. What we, what we also see <coughs> is that we are able to predict some outcomes much better than other outcomes across all the databases, across all the algorithms. Um, and that's, again, coming back to that point two uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, the reason for doing predictive modeling. Getting this insight is important. We like to understand uh, what we can do and what we cannot, and maybe that helps us to focus on some areas more than others. Yes? Uh, question about your handling time. Uh, your, your data collection period for these, I don't know these data sets, right? So are they all sort of uh, concurrently accruing? Uh, and your test uh, and train is sampled from different years, 2014, 2016, I don't know, so that's the sort of question. Because if you had some sort of novel procedure, some sort of novel medication that just went right. stroke or down to zero, then I, you know, I, I'm just because again, all your modeling frameworks are the baseline covariates predict into the future, like time zero, so the future, none of these are like time series or or anything that has a like transfer function. So how do I interpret that without that sort of background information? Yeah. So the, the, your your point is well well taken. So that. So the, the electronic health record changes over time, and we need to, to keep that we need to keep that into consideration as well. So we, we can, of course, do analysis where we train one model in some moment of time and predict in that future and do the same thing at another moment in time and see whether there are differences and maybe also so differences in performances, for example, would be very interesting to look at. There are some papers out there that actually look at the effect of changes over, over time uh, for doing this type of uh, prediction that we do here. Uh, but no, yeah, we're aware of that, and we need to find ways to assess that uh, in this in all these problems, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. I'm not sure. Let's do it first. That's a very good question. Please repeat the question for the recording. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. Uh, your question is if we have multiple modes that say different things, which one are we going to trust? Right? Uh, that's our question. I don't know the answer. Because we do um, the test set, we, it should kind of tell us basically. Um, so the the difference between the models is likely to be how simple the model is. So the just regression is obviously going to uh, be more simple than uh, a deep learning model. So can, can you hit? <laughs> Loud. <laughs> so so I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, harder maybe. I'm going to have to hold this up when I present me. So, um, yeah, I think, I think because we're doing this on the, the test set um, or externally, you can trust the results because, uh, because we've got big data. Um, the, the, this is actually how well it's generalized. So the model that's done the best should be the better model. The only confusing part is someone pointed this out last time we did this, this tutorial. If you have um, a model that does best uh, internally on the test set, but then when you externally validate it, it drops down and other models go up. How do you handle that? And which one do you trust then? Um, that's a harder question. But if you're looking just at the test set and there's one model that does better, then it probably means that for your data, that model just uh, fits it better. The, uh, the complexities of, of the, uh, the problem fit that model more. So I'd just pick whatever model does best.
yeah, so this is uh, this is my bi my biases are under the curve is what I normally pick on that. Like the calibration, you can recalibrate, uh, especially if you know the underlying like prevalence. Yeah. Just want to underline that I think this you know, the work that you and Jenna are, are doing is, is sort of a sea change in how we're able to see a whole major dimension of the performance of, of models. And so I mean, while it's heavily kind of focused on the immediate questions of which one's better and so forth, the, the framework for providing the evidence that begins to enable understanding of that is, is uh, I just want to make sure people aren't, aren't sure. missing the, the import of the, you know, the way this framework is, is allowing us to start to look at these questions for the first time and how exciting that is. Yeah, thank you very much. That, that's actually you're completely right. I'm really excited about all these questions. So all these questions are uh, research questions. And it's really amazing. Yeah, thank you. And heading on to that, I assume you're going to discuss tripod a little bit later, but I'm very interested in this in terms of publications getting to be uh, an influence. Are people who are reporting on predictive models starting to use the tripod guidelines? So Yes. Your, your question is about using tripod, and, and, and so I'm. I know that a lot of groups are now enforcing tripods, and I've, I'm also closely related to some of the authors, and we're discussing that. But we, we, I think we should really push in our work for tripods because it's been well thought through, and and uh, Joe will get back to that in his session. Uh, your first session. Yeah. So the the AUCs that you're uh, reporting here, these are the, the means from the cross validation. Yeah, it's on the test set in this case. Yes. So, like, for, to respond to some of the questions, like one thing you could look at is the, the confidence interval, of, or the variance of that AUC for you know the different iterations of. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's another it's another good uh, good suge suggestion. Yeah, and I I thought about that as well uh, a while ago. So we we don't often really look at. Uh, the differences of the models over the folds and what the effect is and how stable the models are over the folds. We just use an, uh, an average uh, AUC over the folds as our criterion, but that uh, the variance in that is actually also containing information. So I, f I fully agree with you. And, and that is, again, a paper looking at the stability over the folds if we do cross-validation of not only one model, but all these models, but then over all the databases, over all the outcomes. Um, and then, then you can really answer that question, I think. There was one. Yeah, one of the points you made was we can now start to ask questions like, why can we predict uh, hypothyroidism much better than diarrhea? For that, you really need to change your metric that you're looking at here because AUC is very strongly impacted just by sheer class imbalance and sure. incidence yeah. rates. So yeah. if you have something that does not occur 90% of the time and only occurs on 10%, then the baseline is not 0.5 AUC, the baseline is 0.9. So that itself will explain a lot of this. So you need to change that sure. in order for this to be able to answer this question. Thanks. Yeah. I will. No, I wish, yeah. One more question, just going back. Can you explain a little bit more specifically like the features? So there's like a condition. Is it just somebody had this condition in the past? How does that get you to um, Yeah, so we, we define whether a person has that condition in a certain period before the index date. So it's a binary thing. So it's it's yes or no, and that's incor incorporated in the model, and we build it. So yeah. how do you predict conditions? So we just uh, for in this case, for example, for Lasso, and actually for all these algorithms, we just take everything that's out there, and we let the model figure out which parameters to use. So in Lasso, it shrinks the model, and then adds those parameters that have uh, value for prediction. What is, what do you mean by everything? So the full every yeah, everything that's in the record. Yeah. So it's a big, it's a, it's a many, many, many uh, covariates that are put in the model, uh, and it then selects a subset of those variables for the final model. So, so for instance, one type of like heart disease thing totally different from another heart disease, so they're both different. Yeah, so, so we can put them all at, at the concept level or even group them a little bit higher in the vocabulary. Um, on a similar vein, is this question? It would be really interesting to get that paper, that benchmarking paper, to say, okay, compared to Charleston comorbidity, if you did a patient uh, mortality or something, right, or some cost at some period, and then go after the other um, sort of mortality, event, and then go, go after CMS HCC, right? How does this set of like powerful comorbidity they have a like, hundred or so condition, and then to say how much does this blow it out of the water because you're like, feeding it like, thousands of comorbidities, your I mean, your performance. Vastly 
then the, the CR. But a little bit, that's a siren song. Because if you look at the information explanatory power of each variable, it, it drops off super steep. So yes, if you use every variable that ever was created, you may get you know two, three, five percent over you know, just using a handful of variables. Um, but then you're looking into being overfit to your sample, and th there's all kinds of other. Yeah, so of course you have to evaluate that on unseen data when you do that exercise. But but looking at the added value of adding more, da more data-driven approach to that predefined one. Sure. Or slapping hands on providers using models that have the same metric and accuracy metric probably that 60%, 70% is great for Medicare. So, I mean, I think this should probably get out and get disseminated to the payers. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, Jenna's gonna talk a little bit more about that in her talk, so uh, for now I'm gonna park that one, if you don't mind. Um, so I, I showed you this one, so that's interesting, I think, which, which one we can predict and we, we cannot, and we like to understand that, maybe better why. Um, but on overall, when you look at this, there are quite a lot of models that have a good AUC. So that's also an interesting finding that within that group of people, we can do these type of predictions uh, quite well. Um, what was also interesting, that's coming a little bit back to the questions that we had earlier. So what's the differences in the performance of those models in these uh, different outcomes? And you see on gen in general, there is not a lot of differences. Uh, so the, the colors are a bit the same within those panels, within those different outcomes. Um, but that's not uh, always uh, the case. Um, there are actually um, also some problems um, where one of the algorithms was working better than the other one. Um, so here, gradient boosting is, is working better than Lasulogic uh, uh, regression. Differences are not big, but it would still be interesting to understand why that is and, and whether we maybe by adding other covariates in the, in the lasso interactions uh, can still improve lasso and make it comparable to gradient boosting. Um, so in concluding is that um, we, we made a pipeline, a first version of the pipeline in which we can do internal validation. Uh, it's fully data driven so we can either select parameters or we can all just let the data speak for itself and we can run these algorithms, run a whole bunch of algorithms in the, in the data, in the tool. Um, we have implemented ways of disseminating these, uh, these models and results, and transportability assessment should be the gold standard that we should go for as a community. Um, and the, uh, of course, the impact on clinical decision making is uh, a next step. We, we, we need to assess whether what all the work that we do is in the end good for the patient, which is our Odyssey mission uh, altogether. I'd like to point out uh, one thing on this, uh, this slide still is that you need to be aware of the fact that most of the publications that are currently in, out there, they, they talk about one outcome within a cohort of interest. So some of them actually talk about only one cell in this plot. Um, there are papers out there that compare different algorithms, so that's one of these things. There are very few papers that look at results over different databases as we've done here. Um, but the number of papers that talk about all these outcomes within, the, within these cohorts is very, very rare. And, and we, we can really contribute a lot here. And, and my, my dream would actually be that we create something like a, a Google Earth thing where we can zoom in into a certain disease area uh, and look at all the different outcomes and create these type of plots and other measures for all these uh, for all these prediction problems, we, we should be able to extend in all directions. So get more and more databases on board because we have a full data network. Uh, get more outcomes, and remember the only thing you see here is in patients with pharmaceutically treated depression within that cohort. But we have many questions. We have many cohorts of interest, and we should also expand the number of cohorts of interest considerably to create answers to all the questions that you guys are having uh, in the room. Um, so, as you also mentioned, I think we are, we are quite proud that we've built that uh, and we hope that everybody will contribute uh, to, this, to this process. Um, and of course, there's a lot to read if you're interested. 
there are some very good books um, out there about clinical prediction modeling and a, and a whole bunch of literature. If you're interested, I can point you that to that as well afterwards uh, by sending an email. Thank you. <laughs>